Let's move on from perfect competition into the three different varieties of imperfect competition, the first of which we call monopolistic competition. Recognize that when you get away from perfect competition, the demand curve for the firm assumes a negative slope. So here we are. We're going to talk about a high level of competition, but not perfect. So we're going to change some of our assumptions from the perfectly competitive model. Here's our new assumptions. First, like before, very, very many small buyers and sellers. That's not really changed. But the second assumption, homogeneous goods, no. The goods that these companies now produce are different from one another. The company can give them different colors, different names, different warranties, etc. So now each company is truly competing with the others by trying to offer something different. As a result of this, you can expect there'd be a, a lot of advertising in this industry. Uh, the competition will not always be just on a price basis. Highly competitive, but again, you can make your product different than the other guys if you can find subtle ways to do that. The result of being able to do that is that sometimes you can charge a higher price for what you've got. So now, instead of being a price taker, like the perfect competitor, you become a price maker. If you've got a good enough product or your customers think it's good enough, you can charge a different price. Or maybe you can compete on a price basis by undercutting price. So differentiated products, the biggest change we're going to make now. We're going to continue with the assumption of easy entry into and exit from the market. Easy to go into business. We'll see how important that is in a little bit. And finally, we don't have exactly perfect information, but we've got very good information. Maybe not perfect because sometimes the difference in products is somewhat based on customer ignorance. All right, here's an imperfect competitor. In fact, you're being told now this is a monopolistic competitor. We see that he's got a negative slope demand curve. And as a result of that negative slope, and hopefully you were in class for that discussion, his marginal revenue curve is no longer the same line. The demand curve is no longer the same as the marginal revenue curve. And so we have drawn the marginal revenue curve in its appropriate place. It is inside of or beneath the demand curve. It slopes downward and it moves into negative territory. You can have negative values for your marginal revenue. Again, remembering demand curve, also sometimes called the price line. So here we have a demand curve with its marginal revenue curve and the usual cost curves. Marginal cost, average total cost, average variable cost. We'll see we don't really use the AVC here. It's there just to help us remember. So first thing we're doing, of course, look for point alpha. Marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Those two intersect down separately from don't be looking for marginal cost intersecting demand now. Got to change your thinking a little bit. We find point alpha. Alpha tells us quantity. This firm's optimal quantity to produce is going to be 200 units. And we're going to look at that. At 200 units, the company wants to sell 200 units. The question is, what price do they need to charge in order to sell that optimal quantity? If the price is too high, they don't sell enough. If the price is too low, they sell too many. So we read from 200 up to the demand curve and over. And that tells us they need to be charging a price of $9. Now notice, they could charge a higher price. They could charge a lower price. They are price makers. So their choice is to find the price that yields them the optimal quantity. And they do that deriving it from point alpha down to quantity and then up to the price line or the demand curve. How are they doing here? Well, at the same quantity, we're going to read up to the average cost curve and over. We're going to see that their cost per unit is $4. They're charging $9. Hey, they're making an economic profit. Now think about that in terms of perfect competition, because this is very similar. Each firm, because this is the typical firm, all the firms have the similar curves, each firm is making an economic profit. What's going to happen next to this company and every company? They're all out there enjoying these abnormally high profits. They're going to attract more competition. They're going to wake up tomorrow or next month, and they're going to have a lot more competitors and find out that what? They have a lot fewer customers, or at least a few fewer customers. How's that going to affect their 
graph here? The answer is when you have fewer buyers, what? All right, here we are. We've got a monopolistically competitive firm. They were making profits in the first slide. As a result of their and every other firm making profits, we said that would attract more competition. With more competitors, they were going to lose some of their customers. They were going to see a decrease in their market share. So how are we going to portray that? Basically, their demand curve is going to shift to the left. They have a decrease in the number of buyers. The marginal revenue curve associated with that will also shift to the left. We see, again, a reminder, it goes into negative numbers. Now what's the company going to do? As always, they're going to look for point alpha. Once they have found point alpha, they're going to read down and say, hey, how many units should I produce? And at that price, let's read up and see how we're doing, or at that quantity. I read up to my demand curve or my price line, and I say, well, to sell 100 units, I should be charging $4 a piece. That will give me the correct quantity to sell. But, uh-oh, it's costing me more than that, $5 per unit, average cost. So I'm going to wind up losing money in this case. And this is the typical firm. We can assume all the firms are now losing money. And now it becomes a case of how long can you hold on? They've got an economic loss. They can't do that forever, but maybe they hold on long enough and hope some of the other folks go out of business before they do. If some of the other businesses collapse before theirs, they'll start picking back up some of their customers. What will that do to their graph? Okay, as some of their competition folds up and goes out of business because they're losing money, the company that can hang on, the company that has more money in the bank, what we call deeper pockets, starts to gradually bring back some of its customers. And we see that their demand curve has shifted up. And watch very carefully. In this case, we're going to shift the demand curve up just to the point that it's tangent to the average total cost curve. And there is its marginal revenue curve. Fine point alpha, as always. Alpha tells us quantity. At that quantity, we ask, what price should I charge? We read across from the demand curve. We say, well, looks like $4.50 would be the best price in order to sell the optimum quality, quantity. Sorry. We also read up to the cost curve and say, hey, the cost is also $4.50 a unit. So our total revenue and our total costs are going to be the same. The company's breaking even. Now, this is going to be our long-run equilibrium for monopolistic competition. Nobody's making any extraordinary profits, economic profits, so there's nobody coming into business to compete with them. But they're all making a reasonable accounting profit so they can stay in business indefinitely, at least until some other outside factor changes. The similarities in this and perfect competition should kind of smack you in the face. And if you have any questions about any of this, you got to be sure and let me know.